are these people? Yeah. So my last story for for the night is uh, BB speaking at the UN General Assembly, which many people are like, why in the hell would he speak there? Like, if anything, yeah. they have arrested his ass on site. But, of course, we know the UN doesn't do shit, or I argue really cares in terms right. of human rights or anything like that. So Benjamin uh, Netanyahu? So, yeah, so he basically tainted the halls with his propaganda, and I guess shortly before he made a call, I was like, bomb Lebanon, and that's exactly what happened. Um, so I know plenty of our friends in the space have talked about this, and we're kind of a little late to the party here. Um, I did want to bring a slightly different angle to this, though, uh, in terms of something that's kind of connected to me as, you know, an immigrant and then as a child of a Bajan man wanted to highlight something that I don't think was would be addressed anyway, but I thought it was interesting. Um, and actually, it will kind of lead into a segment that I think in talking to Reef, I kind of want to talk about more next week, possibly. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, I want to highlight probably the most viral moment um, that BB had regarding his speech at the UN. But before we get into that, let's move forward. Thank you. Uh, I want to share this article from Common Dreams. Uh, written by Jessica Corbett, where she said, mass walkout as global pariah Netanyahu addresses UN General Assembly. The public rebuke of the Israeli prime minister, said one observer, demonstrates the international community's rejection of genocide. So she continues, a large number of diplomats and other officials walked out of the United Nations General Assembly in New York City on Friday as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu prepared to defend his nation's slaughter of more than 41,000 people in the Gaza Strip during the past year and over 700 in Lebanon this week. Journalists and critics of the global pariah share photos and videos of people filing out of the hall before Netanyahu's address, which came just a day after 25 anti-genocide protesters were arrested for blocking his motorcade in Manhattan. While there was some audience applause from the sparsely populated room on Friday, Friday Al Jazeera's Arabic's Rani Ayari, Ayari. Yeah. that the people you heard cheering the PM during the speech are in the gallery who he brought for that purpose. So this is a picture here from Qud's International News Network. Uh, didn't need, I'm not gonna play the clip because it's like under 10 seconds. But you're basically right. um, uh, the delegations there just walking out um, when BB was starting to speak. Um, Good for them. Yeah. Council of American Islamic Relations National Executive Director Nihad Awad said in a statement that as far as the far right openly racist Israeli government continues its genocide in Gaza and expands its campaign of state terrorism to civilians in Lebanon, this mass walkout during war criminal Benjamin Netanyahu's UN speech demonstrates the international community's rejection of genocide. Awad added that the US President Joe Biden should take note of our government's growing isolation on the international stage, change his policy and support human rights and international law without an exception for the Palestinian people. Since Israeli forces launched their assault on Gaza in retaliation for the Hamas-led October 7th attack, the United States government has stood by Israel, sending billions of dollars in weapons and opposing US, UN resolutions while claiming to be pu pushing for a ceasefire. Addressing the General Assembly earlier this week, Biden called for security for Israel and Gaza free from Hamas's grip. Okay. In response to diplomats' Friday walkout, Tita Parsi, Executive Vice President of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, said the impunity Biden has offered Israel has been used by Netanyahu to make Israel an international pariah, neither good for the U.S. nor for Israel. Parsi also highlighted a clip of Slovenian Prime Minister Robert Gubal's speech to the U.N. in which he urged Netanyahu to 
stop this war now. Yanyahu began his Friday address by taking aim at the world leaders who throughout the week have condemned the recent escalation against Hezbollah and Lebanon, as well as the past year of Israeli forces bombing and starving Palestinians in Gaza. I didn't intend to come here this year. You did, though. My country is at war fighting for its life, Yanyahu said. But after I heard the lies and slanders leveled at my country by many of the speakers standing at this podium, I decided to come here and set the record straight. Um, armed with more of his infamous maps of the Middle East, the right-wing leader went on to claim that Israel seeks peace while also waging to wage war on Hamas governed Gaza until total victory and telling the tyrants of Tehran that if you strike us, we will strike you. Um, mm -hmm. So speaking of, so I do want to play the clip, again, the most viral part. Uh, so. BB loves his maps. Uh, I think we talked about the greater Israel or the new Middle East map yes. showed at an event like this, I yep. think about a year, over a year ago. So mm -hmm. now he has two. And just to show what a racist fuck this person is, um, let's play the clip. Ladies and gentlemen, as Israel defends itself against Iran in the Seven Front War, the lines separating the blessing and the curse could not be more clear. This is the map I presented here last year. It's a map of a blessing. It shows Israel, Israel and its Arab partners forming a land bridge connecting Asia and Europe between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. Across this bridge, we will lay rail lines, energy pipelines, fiber optic cables, and this will serve the betterment of two billion people. Now look at this second map. It's a map, look at the second map. It's a map of a curse. It's a map of an arc of terror that Iran has created an First of all, you could make a land bridge through that same bit of black, Brohim. Right. Like, I'm saying. But speaking of land bridge, and we talked about this last night, what yeah. does this sound like to you? Yeah, Ben-Gurion as well being the sea bridge they want for right. the same reasons. Right. You know, this is all economics that they're trying to convince the UN they have together. Right. So... Yeah. Pose from the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean. Iran's malignant arc has shut down international waterways. It cuts off trade. It destroys millions, destroys nations from within, and inflicts uh -huh. misery on millions. On the one hand, hot calling kettle. On the one hand, a bright blessing, a future of hope. On the other hand, a dark future of despair. And if you think this dark map is only a curse for Israel, if you think that, then you should think again. Because Iran's aggression... Okay, I, I thought again. Still accurate. <laughs> like... If it's not checked, will endanger every single country in the Middle East. Uh -huh. And many, many countries in the rest of the world. Because Iran seeks to... Who's bombing three countries in the Middle East? It's like every sentence I could fucking call out, you know? Right. To impose its radicalism well beyond the Middle East. That's why it funds terror networks on five continents. That's why it builds ballistic uh -huh. missiles for nuclear warheads to threaten the entire world. Because Israel doesn't have those. The world has appeased Iran. It turns a blind eye to its internal repression. It turns a blind eye to its external aggression. Well, that appeasement must end. And that appeasement must end now. Remember, all the people left that room, right? Yeah. So whoever's left is like sycophants already. Nations of the world should support the brave people of Iran who want to rid themselves of this evil regime. 
Responsible governments should not only support Israel in rolling back Iran's aggression, they should join Israel. They should join Israel in stopping Iran's nuclear weapons program. I feel like you could just put a few German speeches on top of it with all the fist pounding and, you know, like a couple of solution based topics thrown in. And anyway, I mean, he just needs a little mustache and he'd look very similar. Um, right. the enemy, like every in this body in the submission. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, Security Council. We're going to have a deliberation in a few months. And I call if you last Security that long Council to snap back UN Security Council sanctions against Iran because we must all do everything in our power to ensure that Iran never gets nuclear weapons. Because they might use them on us, right. even though we have them and we might we've threatened. They've threatened to attack their nuclear facilities, which would cause similar destruction. But, uh, you know, what, whatever. Um, Ugh. So, again, this is the most viral part um, of his speech. Again, we're not going to watch the whole thing because it... I don't want my ears to hurt anymore. But, yeah. well, it's going to hurt more with this clip that I but and TBS like I had this clip saved for days. Not yeah. sure how I wanted to use it. Was looking for it because I thought I bookmarked it. This uh, I found this on Twitter. Uh, yeah. Only to realize like maybe two hours later, as I was prepping last night, that I did send it to Reef in our private Discord. The only thing was I imagined this is BB by the way. Um, obviously younger, but I p pictured him differently, so I didn't recognize this guy. Is it? First. Huh? Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it is. I'm not, well. Because I think he, like, I think he's kind of trying to, we'll, we'll see, we'll play the clip and let yeah. people but this figure is, it out. I don't think it is. This and all might be a future segment in terms of, like, essentially, um, BB's brainwashing against if its view of the Palestinians and the Arabs in general. Um, yeah. A lot of that propaganda kind of came from daddy. Um, that, yeah, I think we probably should do that as a segment in its own right. Um, but, um, but this is a reason why he's going to, and he's going to straight up tell you. So this is, and I'll get into it later, but uh, but this is at the heart as to why Gaza is be in, basically being obliterated right now. So go ahead. Mm -hmm. If we are the chosen people, who are you to tell us what to do? Who are you? Who is the international community to tell Israel what to do? International law? Who? Yes, Wonderful you. thing. It doesn't right. apply on us. It applies on any other place on earth, not on Israel. Because we are the chosen people. Don't you understand it? The second very deep-rooted value is obviously the value of we the victims not only the biggest victims but the only victims around i know many occupations which were longer than israeli occupation than the israeli occupation some were even more brutal even though it's getting harder and harder to be more brutal than the israeli occupation i don't recall one occupation in which the occupier present himself as the victim not only the victim the only victim if to phrase here if to quote here the late Golda Meir, whom I quoted also last time, I know, but it is so unforgettable, I have to use it again. She once said that we will never forgive the Arabs for forcing us to kill their children. We are the victims. We are forced to kill their children. Poor us. And as the victim and the only victim in history, again, it enables us the rights to do whatever we want. And nobody is going to tell us what to do because we are the only victims. To this, there is a third very deep-rooted value, and this is the very deep belief, again, everyone will deny it, but if you scratch under the skin of almost every Israeli, you'll find it there. The Palestinians are not equal human beings like us. They are not like us. They don't love their children like us. They don't love life like us. They were born to kill. They are cruel. 
They are sadists. They have no values, no manners. Look how they kill us. This is very, very deep-rooted in Israeli society, and maybe that's the key issue. Because as long as this continues, nothing will move. As long as most of the Israelis don't perceive the Palestinians as equal human beings, we are so much better than them. We are so much developed than them. And we are so much human than them. As long as this is the case, all our dreams, and we have some dreams, and I'll get to them, all our dreams will never become true as long as this core issue will not change. I sense the sarcasm. You know? Mm. Like, I think he's trying to prove a point about the way Israelis... Again, again it would help to know who that is. Yeah. You know? Uh, but I do if, feel there's some... Well, sarcasm or not. There yeah, is, he's being accurate about what they feel like. You know? Right. Yes. Like... So... so but I, what kind of tripped me up was, like the victim olympics yeah in terms of you know as a black person you know when we talk about what happened to us in terms of slavery like the argument usually white people make is get over it that happened to you a long time ago like yeah. you're free now like you're not under that same Thing anymore you're no longer a victim stop playing the victim stop being, you know like but for an israeli it's almost like the opposite not to say like they have to relish in their victimhood but it's almost like they get more sympathy sympathy in terms of like the holocaust primarily but then like yeah but he's right in terms of like the victim mentality is what kind of causes the Zionist view to basically be like, oh, we have a right to essentially do whatever we want because we were victimized. So we can do whatever without, uh, seemingly without any consequence. So I think that was kind of the interesting that thing there. But, you know, but we've talked about this on other segments before in terms of the propaganda that is being imparted in Israeli children, like yeah. in terms of their feelings towards Arabs in the region in general, like they're better than them, more developed, they, like, you know, so basically they are the savages, as we were called once upon a time, and probably still, um, yeah. you know, so... But I thought that was kind of an interesting contrast to what BB was saying without necessarily saying it. Um, because he knows that if he said that, at, well, he said some stuff like that indirectly. Very similar, been, right. But it hasn't necessarily been reprimanded for it in the way that he probably should have. Yeah. Um, so going off of that, so BB left. Right. And then shortly after that, um, we have Mia Motley, who we've talked about before on the show. She is Prime Minister of Barbados, uh, the island of my dad's side of the family. Um, she did, uh, I think she spoke for about half an hour. So we're not going to watch her whole thing. But she basically, in her way, without saying his name, uh, kind of condemned BB in terms of the statements that he was making regarding Gaza and in the Middle East in general. There is some things that she was saying here in terms of Gaza that I have a problem with. And I yeah. think that leads to a bigger problem in terms of what I've been hearing and kind of what I've been mentioning, you know, online and on this show in general. Um, but why don't we play what we, she says here? And then I think it's, it's around five ish minutes. Okay. Talk about it. So go ahead. Cool. We'll do this a little yeah. bit. There needs to be global peace. And those of us who are old enough would have recognized that there are peaks and valleys as it relates to this issue of conflict. There are few areas where the world is more in need of the United Nations acting as the United Nations to secure the objectives of the Charter than in the area of peace and security. The silence that has engulfed Sudan is unacceptable and may well be rooted.
reflected in the racism that the world still carries as a badge of honor from the victories of the last great war of the World War II. The actions in Myanmar cannot continue. Ukraine has sucked more oxygen out of the global community and the global financial system than any of us can appropriately accept at the very time when the world needs to be applying its resources and efforts to fight in the greatest crisis known to mankind. And the spread of the war from Gaza to the consequences in the West Bank to now clearly what is happening in Lebanon as we speak with Israel, all of these are but the tip of an iceberg of death, violence and instability and robs the global community of oxygen and resources at the very time when we need it most in a strategic way. We all know as students of history that even the longest war in history came to an end. These wars, yes, they too will come to an end, but the question is when and at what cost and without much loss of life, with how many children not being able to be either given the chance to live or will now live with memories of war that will affect their every action for the next 60, 70, 80 years of their lives. Innocent people are paying the price with the one thing that is theirs to give, and they don't give it willingly. It is their life. Unless we address the root causes of these wars, one by one, and the manners in which they are being sustained and financed, we will never, never know anything else other than war and rumors of war in these theaters. The transmittal of these scenes of horror in real time into people's bedrooms, into people's living rooms, will trigger two extreme reactions, neither of which are acceptable to us in the third decade of the 21st century. We will either get the desensitizing of ordinary people to the loss of lives, especially those of innocent children and women on the one hand, or we will get on the other hand, the anger and inclination for vengeance that it spawns necessarily. We need peace. And it cannot be too difficult for us to work for peace. It is the same Bible that tells us in the stories of the Old Testament, much which has guided many people across this world. But when we turn from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it is Romans that says to us, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, not any country, not any human being. So that the Bible can't be used as a convenient aid when it suits us and rejected when it doesn't. In the midst of this maelstrom, we were very clear. My country took the step this year of recognizing and establishing diplomatic relations with the state of Palestine in spite of having supported a two-state solution since 1969. Maybe don't support that then. And we did this because it is clear to us that the state and people of Palestine, human beings, are entitled to full recognition by integration into and support from the international community. The Charter does not say we the people, with the exception of any one group from any one part of the world. We join with others, therefore in congratulating the State of Palestine and taking their seat among the United Nations member states as they did on the 10th of September of this year. And let me be clear, we condemn the actions of Hamas on October 7th. But mm -hmm. we equally and strongly deplore the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza, which is the result of the disproportionate use of force by Israel. There's no justification for it. And that is why treaties exist governing the rules of engagement for war. Because we as human beings learnt better and know better and committed to better. A two-state solution, no matter how elusive it may appear to be now, is the only answer. And I've said already this week that we have known difficult battles in mankind's history. But when we were in it, we didn't think we could achieve it. But we did. We abolished slavery. We removed apartheid in South Africa. These diff battles are not beyond our creativity, our capacity, and our resilience to resolve them. Similarly, we insist that the killing in Ukraine really has to stop. The people of Ukraine must be allowed to live within the internationally recognized boundaries of their state in peace and freedom from the threat of use or force. And as I said, it is sucking too much oxygen out of the global financial system and countries that should be the beneficiary of aid are being told that they may have to wait 
in the interest of the defense of others because of war. I say to us truly, there has to be a singular commitment to build a peace, truly. Thoughts, Reeve? Uh, a couple. Um, first, I'll bring this just as thought. Um, let's see if it will let me do that easily. Um, yeah, I think if I do this, I have to stop this. Um, I mean, you know, I, I wish they had the same fervor for when the Donbass is being bombed. Uh -huh. That would be nice. Um, you know, but clearly that's not what they're told. But I, I feel like this is appropriate now. You know, right? Like, I, I feel like that turn the other cheek thing only works one direction most of the time. So, you know, but in a two state, definitely ain't where it's at at this point. I think Israel has forfeited their right to statehood with their actions. Right. And um, I love Vice President um, Marlow. I think, I mean, I, I mean, she was a good contrast to what BB was saying earlier. Right. The problem that I had in her statements while mostly correct, someone, uh, Tia Orca, asked me what my thoughts, I'm going to share them. Uh, so thank you. Um, I do not like, and it, the two-state solution talking point is what Kamala has said, is what Biden has said. You notice that every time, and, and I think that talking point is kind of seeping into the liberal sphere in terms of the idea yeah. that the two-state solution is the answer to it. And my question to people who say that is, well, have Palestinians, some, and I'm not talking about like Palestinians in elites or whatever, like not them. I'm talking about actual Palestinians on the ground. What do they want? And that's the first thing, because we never hear from Palestinians generally what they want in terms of what their liberation is set to be like. And that in and of itself, I think is another talking point because we, again, our patron saint of this channel, oh, well, this show, Kwame Toure said, what about peace versus liberation? Mm -hmm. you know, we keep hearing about peace. Uh, Prime Minister Bartlo mentioned peace. You can argue the Israelis, well, not now, but at least when they were offing Palestinians had peace. Yeah. You know, does that mean that the Palestinians were having peace? No. Like, I can have peace right now. I am peaceful right now, somewhat. But does it mean like you, Reef, are peace, have peace right now? So, there's inequity, there's inequity in peace. Mm. So what we want and what we desire for Palestinians is liberation. And I wish she would have went there uh, in the spirit of her brother, in a sense, in, w w within the islands, Kwame Toure, talking about liberation. But, you know, so it's, so I'm getting tired of, but all that to say, I'm getting tired of, these liberal, and I don't want to say she, well, I think she's trying to be diplomatic in her, yeah, what she's saying. So I want to be very fair to her on that. But that being said, we talk about the two state solution. Number one, Bibi has said many times that's a non starter. So how in the yeah. hell can you expect to get a two state solution from Bibi when he's even said, no, that's not happening? So what do you oppose? Do you we do to get him to that point? Number one, number two is again, what does that look like? You, we talk about it as such a nebulous thing that, but there's no explanation what it is. And actually, I was telling me, I think we definitely need to do a segment on this to kind of unpack that a little bit more. What if there's any pros versus cons of what a two state solution 
is like. And he is. Is. So, um, so I, so I'm kind of disappointed. Again, I get what she was going for in saying here, but a two state solution isn't going to be the answer. And I see people in chat are like, that is gone. Like, yeah, we are beyond a two state solution at this point. So, but that's a talking point. And I think, especially assuming we have Kamala Harris as our president in the near few months, that's what the talking point is going to be a two state solution, a two state solution, a two state solution. And people are going to get yeah. in their heads, but they have no clue as to what that is or how we're going to get there, which we're not because. We yeah. continue to send weapons to Israel, and they continue to bomb the region like it's nothing. So, I, um, yeah, you got a bit more from her, I think, a bit right? More from her, and indulge me a little bit. Um, yeah, this is for my FBA and ADA's community. Shout out to you all. I know you hate my guts, but <laughs> I don't care. Um, they love you. They're fine. No, they do not. And I don't really care <laughs> if they love me or not. But she brings up another important point that's important to that community right now um, that I thought was interesting, but I want to kind of share it uh, <laughs> in terms of conversations that we had regarding this topic in the past brief. And then just with our friends like DJ and Nice, we've had this conversation with him. Um, but she brought this up, and I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, so this is kind of off of where we we're going. So this is kind of a little off topic, but more of a react part, mm. if anything. But I didn't want to kind of mention this in terms of a conversation that I've had maybe within the last month or so. so while cool. we play this part, this will be fairly short, I think. So okay. you can head and play. My friends, we are reminded that 2024 is the final year of the United Nations decade for the people of African descent. Much has been achieved, but the recognition, the justice and the development for, for people of African descent that was promised by this decade has to say the least not yet been fully realized. And it is for this reason that the Caribbean community joins the growing chorus and my own country in particular, for the immediate proclamation of a second decade to complete the unfinished work and address the matter of reparations for slavery and colonialism. I start here because this is a necessary but complex conversation and the Caribbean community is resolute that it must happen. Its resolution lies, and I want to be very clear, its resolution lies in a multi-generational approach in the same way that the 20 million pounds sterling debt that was incurred by the British government only was repaid in this 21st century, almost 200 years later. So that the notion of unaffordability becomes a non-issue once we recognize that the solution to reparations must be multi-generational and grounded in development. Yeah, so she was talking about reparations there, which I will say this. The fact that she used her status to kind of talk about that in front of you, that I have to give a note to that because sure. I don't see and i'm gonna and i'm gonna make people mad but i don't really care like i don't see african americans having that kind of stature at this point to be able to do that as of now so well, they're kept from power frequently right. so i'm glad that she spoke up in recognition of that using her plan and this is not the first time she's done this um uh, she has spoken out for for the case of reparations in uh within british government as well uh we did a story about that maybe about a year ago uh mm. did her my one critique and this is in light of a conversation that i had with uh roger meadows those of you who know him 
um, about a month ago was I strongly believe in the case of reparations that it should be something that the Black community within the diaspora, not just here, but where Black, Western Black people live, this should be a multi, this should be a coalition there. Um, the issue is, is that due to the cultural differences, whether you live in America or the West Indies or in Europe or in Latin America, that the idea is like, if you live in one of those areas, you work on rep the act of reparations on your own due to those cultural differences, mostly. There are different, like, right. that. I don't necessarily agree with that stance. Why? Because the issue is, it's like, I see like the ADOS community right now kind of not aligning with Jill Stein because she has a reparations she talks about reparations as part of her policy. So right now, I think they're kind of interested in learning more from her, which fine, you can definitely do that. But why not be in collaboration with other Black people, like we've talked about in terms of CARICOM and their tell points for reparations, which we've mentioned on this show, who have been doing it for just as long if not longer than Jill Stein has mentioned reparations as part of her policy. Um, right. So, so Roger and I had that discussion because he doesn't, and I'm not, not criticizing him at all. This is just our conversation. He kind of mentioned to me, well, not to say he doesn't, he doesn't, he feels kind of like, if you're a Black American, we take care of reparations for me as, and this is the argument that me as an immigrant, even though we share that kind of ancestry and that issue in terms of reparations, given my family's based in the Caribbean, that I should focus my efforts on what's happening in my case in the Caribbean and Europe. Um, mm. But ultimately what came out of the conversation was, I think like we need to combine forces in this issue as black people, period. And he was like, well, if would black immigrant black people, would they speak on behalf of black Americans, basically, if the situation was called for? And well, it's similar to how we have problems with like state based Medicare, too. It's like when one state gets it, they stop fighting for the other states to get it. They've got right. theirs. Right. So, you know, you kind of got to do that all at once and have an entire, you know, solidarity across international lines, seeing how it is an international problem, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. But, I, yeah. I, um, I kind of mentioned this to you earlier today before we went live, just, like, I've seen other marginalized people, like basically they're making the case right now, like they may hate what's happening in Gaza right now. But the argument is, oh, we have to vote for Kamala because if we don't, then Trump, who the boogeyman, he's going to take away our rights. So we have to vote for Kamala in order to preserve the rights we have. And my argument right. is, well, if you have those rights, rights are something that, and basically the idea of rights is that something that you get automatically on the account of you exist. Just being human, you are entitled to those things. Education, food, those type of things. These are the things that as a human, no matter what, you should have. So... If you are afraid of Trump taking away your rights, quote unquote, I would argue if there are rights to begin with, there are probably more privileges that the government is allowing you to have. And that kind of speaks into, you made the point of the Democrats, how are they fighting truly for your rights in terms of once you get it, they cannot be taken away. So... Have they really been fighting for your rights or are they giving you crumbs in terms of giving you slightly more privileges 
than you may have right now. And the issue that I have is, especially for certain groups, is that you may have a couple of privileges, but once you get those privileges, you're just like, I want to hold on to those privileges and fuck everyone else who doesn't have it. I want to preserve what I got. And that's not solidarity. And I feel, and I said this to you, I don't feel like there's not going to be a revolution in this country at all, because I think generally we're just too selfish to be like, if I don't have, like, my rights are not worth the sacrifice of another group who doesn't have it. It's either we all have it or none of us have it. And that's the stance that I think that we lack generally in terms of being in solidarity with people. It's like certain groups of people get a little bit and it's like, well, I want to maintain this a little bit and fuck everyone, not to say fuck everybody else, but it's like, if my rights are threatened, I want to hold on to it. So I'd rather hold mm -hmm. on to it and have other people lose out than rather being willing to sacrifice to give them up in terms of fighting for the people who also need it. And yeah. that's kind of what I'm seeing right now. But I'm saying all of that in terms of probably with the idea of reparations that there needs to be, in my opinion, this there needs to be more of an international, well, I'm on the Black community base in order to make this happen. And it's just sad to me that it's like CARICOM has their thing, the ADOS FEA group has their thing, which is kind of even nebulous to me, but I don't know. You know, but we're just so separated. And when it's all tied eventually to the same corporations that have gone rich off our backs, that have benefited from our labor, and, you know, we're not necessarily combining forces. Because as I say, this country became independent 100 years after the first slaves were brought here. So to all the Black Americans, your issue is not just with the American government. Your issue is also with the British, too. So if anything, you should be aligned with what CARICOM is doing and what people, Black people in Europe are doing or trying to do in terms of the reparations that you are seeking, because I'm sure many of your ancestors were British themselves. So... Well, where those, where those crown jewels come from? Right. Uh -huh. Exactly. But a lot of those, these people will kind of deny that heritage or that ancestry. So, so whatever you can, you, you can believe what you want, but you know, as the, as the scientists say, we all come from the same continent once upon a time, or at least our beginnings come from the same continent once upon a time. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I just thought it was very interesting because like. We talk about reparations a lot, but often we talk about them in terms of Black America. And I just wanted, kind of wanted to share the perspective of a Caribbean woman talking about them. And like, she mentioned joining the chorus, but I really wish she was a little more direct in saying the diaspora at large, which mm -hmm. I think would mean a lot more to an FBA or ADOS possibly. So I really wish, I think that she kind of missed an opportunity to be more in, conclu um, inclusive there. But that being said, I do appreciate her speaking up against rep for reparations in terms of having the platform and the status that she has to speak about it in the United Nations. What that's going to do, who knows? But um, just wanted to highlight that. A little bit. Well, no, I'm with you. So, but yeah. Yeah. So, as I said, you know, I'm thinking in terms of this segment, we probably need to do a little more of a deep dive in what the two state solution is and whether or not it's actually a good thing. Uh, so, let us know in the comments whether you think, or even in the chat, where we should pursue that segment and try and get people on who can speak more about that. Um, but talking about stuff like these is why YouTube hates us and it's not monetizing us, but we don't rely on YouTube. We, the good thing is we rely on you, our audience. 
So if you want to donate so you're able to hear segments that, like the ones we're thinking of doing, you can go to our to, to that link that you see at the bottom of your screen, or you can use your phone to scan the QR code if you use your phone. Or if you're in chat on YouTube, you can go to exclamation point donate to type that in the chat and the link will pop up in chat where you can also donate. Um, as we say, you know, YouTube is suppresses us heavily because we're not advertiser friendly. We don't talk the good stories that will bring them money, uh, but we're not interested in money necessarily. We're interested in, you know, giving truth and information to you all. Uh, so please don't forget to like and subscribe to us. That really helps us in order to fight suppression. And please share our content, um, especially the things that you think are very interesting that you're you want your family and your friends to have more information on. And be sure to leave a comment. We do read them. We often sometimes get stories out of your comments. So uh, connect with us and tell us maybe we should talk about this and we will see if we can try and do it. And help us get to free k We've been growing steadily uh, over the last few weeks, especially. So we definitely want to continue that momentum going in order for the algorithm maybe to recognize us and push our content more. Um, yeah. As always, we appreciate you guys, and we love you, and thank you for watching.